Born of gas and dust about 4.56 billion years ago, Earth has had a dramatic history. Scientists have attempted to reconstruct its earliest stages from evidence preserved in meteorites and Earth itself, as well as direct observations of distant stars and nebulae. But our knowledge of events in this remotest part of our planet's past remains incomplete. The solar system began to form about 4.56 billion years ago, when an immense cloud of gas and dust, the solar nebula, started to collapse under gravity. As it collapsed, the cloud flattened into an ever faster spinning disk, with a bulging center that heated and condensed to form the Sun. The orbiting debris formed the four inner rocky planets. In the cooler outer disk, the four gas giant formed, then the small dwarf planets, and finally, a vast cloud of comets. Altogether, the solar system extends about 6,000 billion kilometers from the Sun. The solar nebula was initially a vast but dense cloud of cold gas and dust is thought to have originated from the death of even older stars, and was effectively recycled. Under the influence of gravity, the slowly rotating solar nebula began to contract and therefore spin faster. The cloud condensed into a disk with a dense, extremely hot, luminous center and diffuse outer region. The increasing speed of rotation condensed the icy gas and dust into rings within the protoplanetary disk. Colliding particles of dust and ice clumped together, and their increasing gravity attracted yet more material, forming planetesimals. Those planetesimals nearest the protosun consisted of the most heat-resistant and dense materials such as rock and iron. Attracted to each other by gravity, they collided and formed the four rocky planets of the system. In the cool outermost rings of the protoplanetary disk, beyond the asteroid belt, ice and gas could survive. Here, planetesimals made of rock and ice grew large enough to attract, and be enveloped by, deep clouds of gas. The four gas giants were formed, and shortly afterward the protosun became a fully-fledged star. Following the formation of the planets, some gas and other unaccreted material still remained in the protoplanetary disk. Most was blown away by radiation generated by nuclear fusion in the sun. The remaining planetesimals form the vast and distant Oort cloud of comets at the edge of the solar system. According to the most widely accepted theory of how the solar system formed, known as the nebular hypothesis, the rocks and ice that shared the same orbit around the developing sun coalesced under gravity, in a process called cold accretion. The largest bodies in each ring attracted the most material and formed planetesimals, loose collections of rock and ice with a uniform structure. As a planetesimal grew larger, its gravitational pull increased. It became more tightly held together, and it drew in rocks from its immediate surroundings with greater force, leading to a period of intense combardment and growth. Eert, and the three others rocky planets of the inner solar system, were formed in this way about 4.56 billion years ago. Mercury, the smallest of the rocky planets, has, like part of Earth's moon, a highly cratered surface interspersed with dark lava fields. These impact craters all resulted from the same phase of intense meteorite bombardment as that suffered by Earth, and which lasted until about 3.5 billion years ago. The earliest known moon rocks have been reliably dated at about 4.5 billion years old, indicating that Earth's satellite was formed not long after Earth itself, most astronomers agree with the giant impact theory, which proposes that the Moon originated when a planet the size of Mars collided with the young Earth and tore away a huge amount of its surface. Continuous heavy meteorite bombardment over the following billion years left the Moon's rocky surface severely cratered. A period of volcanic activity then followed, and lava oozed out of cracks in the crust to fill low-lying craters. The lava solidified, forming the Moon's vast dark maria, which are still visible from Earth today. Earth's early history was violent and dramatic. Its mass began to take shape slightly over 4.5 billion years ago. Within 50 million years, its core had formed and, in turn, generated a magnetic field. However, it was not until the atmosphere and surface of the crust were relatively stable, about 3.5 billion years ago, that life had a good chance to evolve and thrive. Soon after it formed, most of Earth's mineral material separated from a uniform ball into the intensely hot metallic core and the cooler rocky mantle. 
The iron-nickel composition of the core is indicated by measurements of density, the chemistry of iron meteorites, and Earth's magnetic field. The magnetic field also reveals that part of the core must be liquid and circulate. Electrically conductive molten iron that generates magnetism. Analysis of earthquake waves shows the outer core is liquid, while the inner core is solid. As iron changes from solid to liquid at the boundary, energy is released, driving convection in the outer core. Within the mantle, gravity, which acts on differences in density between hot and cold rock, causes the mantle to flow in a pattern of convection. Colder, dense material sinks deep into the mantle, especially in subduction zones. This downward flow is balanced by the upward rise of hot and less dense mantle, either as plumes beneath hot spots, or upwelling beneath mid-ocean spreading ridges. With its opposite poles, the Earth's magnetic field corresponds to that generated by a bar magnet, but it is formed by electrical currents generated by the fluid motion of the outer core. The mechanism may work like that of an electrical dynamo, which converts mechanical energy into electromagnetic energy. On average, the magnetic field switches its polarity or direction about every 500,000 years, but the last reversal was some 780,000 years ago. The axis of polarity is also aligned differently from Earth's axis of rotation. The intensity of the field fluctuates, but is sufficient to align tiny, iron-rich particles as if they were compass needles within certain rocks formed at the Earth's surface. Because of this, some solidified lavas and other rocks provide a record of the field's polarity when they were originally formed. Measurement of these fossil or paleomagnetic fields has revealed a chronological history of Earth's polarity reversals. Luminous aurorae appear in the polar night skies when Earth's magnetic field traps charged particles carried from the sun by the solar wind. Atmospheric gas particles produce a spectrum of colors. Earth's present oxygen-rich atmosphere differs greatly from its original atmosphere, which consisted of the light gases hydrogen and helium and other volatile gases. However, in the latter stages of the sun's formation, this first atmosphere is blasted away by a surge of the solar wind, the continuous stream of atomic particles given off by the sun, only to be replaced by a second, more stable atmosphere as Earth continued to evolve and develop. Intense volcanic activity expelled vast amounts of volatile gases. Known as outgassing, this process released abundant nitrogen, carbon dioxide, and water vapor as well as ammonia, methane and smaller amounts of other gases. The amount of oxygen in the atmosphere is believed to have slowly increased as microorganisms converted carbon dioxide to oxygen via photosynthesis. Clouds of water vapor condensed and precipitated, forming surface water and the first oceans. Earth is unique among the planets if the solar system and having abundant surface water that is being constantly recycled between its atmosphere add terrestrial water bodies such as seas, lakes and oceans. Today, around two-thirds of Earth's surface is covered with seawater, and interactions between the oceans and atmosphere are vital or maintaining the planet's climate and life. Ocean formation probably began during the first 500 million years of Earth's history, when the planet first cooled sufficiently to allow water molecules to condense, fall onto the surface, and persist as freestanding water bodies. Zircon mineral grains laid down water have been dated to over 4 billion years old, indicating that some surface water existed at that time. Some of Earth's oldest rocks are pillow lava, from western Greenland, many of which are up to 3.8 billion years old and were formed by underwater eruption. The early ocean waters reacted with carbon dioxide from the atmosphere to deposit calcium and magnesium carbonates as limestones. Weathering of rocks on the first continental landmasses also leached soluble salts into seawater. Australian limestone formations known as stromatolites, which were formed by microscopic blue-green algae or cyanobacteria, indicate that fully saline oceans existed around 3.5 billion years ago. Coral reefs are present-day biodiversity hot spots, the ocean's equivalent of tropical rainforests. The largest living structures on Earth, even the skeletons and shells of their inhabitants build up the seabed, altering the underwater environment both biologically and physically. Many living organisms record daily, monthly and seasonal growth cycles by the changing rates of growth in their shells and skeletons. Coral, for example, deposts a new layer of limestone every day, and it is particularly influenced by lunar monthly growth cycles. 
by studying fossil corals from the early Devonian period, there was probably 410 days in a year during this part of Earth's history. Since Earth's orbit around the Sun has remained constant, the Devonian day must have been shorter, just 21 hours, Today, continents make up about one-third of Earth's surface but contain the oldest rocks on the planet, over 3.8 billion years old. Analysis of these rocks reveals even older zircon minerals that formed over 4 billion years ago. Geochemical investigation of the zircons and smaller fragments within them shows that they formed at relatively low pressures and temperatures in molten material rich in water and silica at convergent plate boundaries, such as volcanic island arcs. This suggests that plate movement and subduction were active and liquid water and continental crust were present before 4 billion years ago. Subduction of the primitive crust rocks led to selective melting with increasing heat at depth. Preferential melting of silicate minerals with the lowest melting points and relatively lower density formed magmas that roses into the crust and solidified, forming granitic rock bodies near the surface. These initial island arcs, microcontinents, and their granitic bodies grew further as they converged and joined together. It is likely that the first continental crust formed after a primitive crust had already developed and convection had started in the mantle. Continental crust informed when rocks in the mantle melt and later solidity, in the process becoming differentiated from the mantle. The process was probably particularly rapid above sinking flows in the mantle and slower above rising flows, where the continuous supply of mantle rocks slowed the rate of differentiation. Earth's thin outer crust and upper mantle, down to a depth of about 100 to 300 kilometers, are divided into continent-sized plates that jostle against one another. As the plates move, oceans are created and later disappear, and volcanoes and mountain chains are formed. Oceanic plates move under gravity because they are colder and denser than the mantle below. As they do so, the mantle wells up, and the crust bulges, ruptures along weak points called faults, and eventually rifts apart. Pressure release allows the hot crust to melt, forming magma that erupts as lava through ridges and valleys on either side. As they slowly cool and shrink, the ridge flanks subside and their surface is smoothed out by the deposition of blankets of sediment. New crust is created at spreading ridges, but Earth is not expanding, divergence in one place results in convergence in another. On average, the crust is less dense than the mantle, and oceanic plates are denser than continental plates because they contain a thinner crust. As a result, where oceanic and continental plates collide, the heavier oceanic plate is overridden by the continental plate and descends into the mantle, melting and releasing magma, which erupts at the surface. Volcanoes and earthquakes are violent expressions of Earth's internal dynamic forces. The vast majority occur at plate boundaries, and they are intimately connected to plate interaction. Diverging plates stretch and break, generating shallow earthquakes and volcanic eruptions. Most of WHIH occur at spreading ridges in ocean depths and produce magma made up mainly of basalt. Converging plates, however, generate earthquakes as far as 700 kilometers. Magma rises through the crust, assimilating rock materials and changing composition as it goes before erupting explosively through surface volcanoes, some of which form volcanic islands. Plate movement has has a significant impact on the evolution and distribution of life. Convergence brings different organisms together in competition, while divergence separates species groups, which then evolve in different conditions. An example is the supercontinent of Gondwana, formed around 500 million years ago. Evolving life forms spread throughout this enlarged land mass, leaving a record of themselves behind as fossils. Thus, fossils of the same species have been recovered in rocks from what are now widely separated continents. Only when isolating these creatures from one another, did groups begin to evolve in different ways. <laughs>